most New Testament scholars today, whether they're believing New Testament scholars or atheist, agnostic New Testament scholars, and believing there's a lot of atheist and agnostic Jew, uh, uh, of New Testament scholars. There's even some Jewish New Testament scholars. A lot of New Testament scholars aren't Christians, believe it or not. And, um, you know, they will, most of them agree that the Gospels belong to the genre of Greco-Roman biography, or at least they share a lot of common. There's overlap with that, that genre. Now, what does that mean? Why, why do they think the Gospels are ancient biographies? And let me give you, there's usually 10 characteristics of, of Greco-Roman biography. And by the way, you say, why not Jewish biography? Weren't the earliest Christians Jewish? Yes, they were. But for some reason, Jews were not writing biographies of their sages during the time of Jesus. We don't know why, but that's just the way it is. They weren't. So if the earliest Christians were going to write biographies of Jesus, then Greco-Roman biography was the only game in town. Now, what does that mean? Why, why would we say that they're Greco-Roman biographies? Well, let me just give you a, a few of the characteristics of Greco-Roman biography. In Greco-Roman biography, it focuses on a main character rather than on an event like a war or a nation or a government or an era. Like um, Thucydides wrote a history of the Peloponnesian War in which Greece or, or Athens was going against all the rest of what would be modern day Greece and it lasted almost three decades, the war did. So he wrote a history, that's a history. It doesn't focus on any particular person it focuses on this war and everything that took place during it. A biography focuses on an individual. It's the main character, and that's what that biography is about. You say, well, duh. All right, well, that that's means it's a biography. Okay, so we, it doesn't have to, that doesn't mean it's Greco-Roman biography, but it's a biography. And of course, the Gospels have a main character, Jesus. In Greco-Roman biography, we learn something of the main character's ancestry. And then we move rapidly along to the beginning of their public life. So maybe some of you have asked the question, why don't the Gospels contain much information on Jesus' childhood? Why, do, why don't we have these stories? Why do we have to wait for these kind of Gnostic Gospels or the non-canonical Gospels, the ones that didn't make it in the New Testament, to hear a few stories about Jesus' childhood? Um, why aren't they in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And the reason being is because this was typical of Greco-Roman biography. It would talk about the family lineage, who the, the line, uh, family line this person's from. Did they come from a great military or political family or that of a philosopher? What's their lineage? What's this person's pedigree? And then, once that is established, you might have one or two events usually from the person's childhood, and boom, you launch right into when they went into their public career, be it politics or the military or, or whatever. And that's exactly what we find with the Gospels. It talks about it either as genealogy, which goes back to God, <laughs> or uh, it's, it's connecting him in that way as the Messiah, uh, or Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel starts off and just says, as uh, Isaiah the prophet said, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths of our God. And then it's not Jesus preparing the way of God, it's John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. So what is that saying? And then, and then you've got John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us. So you have this very beginning in all four Gospels that link Jesus to God. And then, boom, right into his public career at, uh, as an itinerant preacher. Greco-Roman biographies were usually of the same general length between 10 and 20,000 words. When you come to the Gospel of Mark, he's right down there with the, uh, on the bottom end. You come to the Gospel of Luke, he's nearing 19,000 words. So it's right within that range of, what, of the size of, of Greco-Roman biographies. And the reason they, they were the size is because that's about as many words. 20 to 20,000 words would be, 20 to 25,000 words would be max which you could fit on a scroll. And they didn't have television back then. They didn't, you didn't have Netflix or DVDs. And so what people did for entertainment a lot was they'd sit and listen to stories being told. And so a biography 
might take about three hours to read through, and that's what people would do in the evening for entertainment and for education. And so they were around this length. The main subject's character in uh, Greco-Roman biography is illuminated through his words and deeds. This is important. It's really fascinating. In fact, um, one of the most prolific uh, biographers of that day was a guy named Plutarch. Not the guy from uh, Hunger Games, but the real Plutarch, who lived, was born around the year 40, died around the year 120. And it's been the case that much of what we know about the ancient world comes from Plutarch. It's been thought this from the Renaissance period to the present. Um, and he's got a famous passage in his uh, biography of Alexander the Great in the first chapter where he says, look, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about all the great deeds that this person did, like where thousands, they, they were involved in a battle where thousands fell. Um, no, we're just, I'm just going to be talking about deeds and teachings of this person that illuminate the character of who they were. We're trying to tell, give you an idea of who this person was because ancient biographies were written with moral purposes in mind usually. You read a biography and it tells you how to live, character qualities to emulate, character qualities to avoid. And so that's what biographies were about. Who is this person? And so when we keep that in mind and we come to the Gospel of Mark, which is the um, scholars believe is the very first and earliest gospel to have been written, the question is, is Jesus divinity in Mark? So you have a number of scholars who would say, all right, Mark's written first, and then after that you probably have Matthew, and then you have Luke, and then finally, toward the end of the first century, you've got John. And John is really, really clear that Jesus is God. But they'll go back and they'll say, well, but when we come to that earliest gospel of Mark, it's not so clear that he's God. In fact, a lot of people will say it doesn't say he's God at all. It just calls him the Son of Man. He's the Messiah, but that's about it. He's a spe special guy, but that's about it. But when you read the gospel of Mark with its genre in mind, that it's ancient biography, it's like, whoa, things change. It's, it's like this. When I was a kid, you guys didn't have all that. I'm 56. But when I was a kid, I remember for Christmas one year, I got uh, this, this book. It wasn't a coloring book, but it, you open it up and it's got all these lines and, and it just looked like scribble and you just couldn't make anything out of it. Well, along with that book came these cardboard kind of sunglasses. I, um, I don't think we had them here a couple of months ago with the eclipse. I, I, but I, I had a speaking engagement out in Nebraska at that time, and so I was in a city, which is one of the, 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 was one of the best cities in the country, to see the total eclipse. It was amazing. And they had this, um, these, these cardboard kind of glasses that they'd give you to prevent you from going blind, that you'd see it until it was a full eclipse, then you could take it off. And they had these like welder things in it, but they were just cardboard. Well, it's kind of like that, but when I was a kid, but they had these, like one of them had red lenses and another had blue lenses. So you'd say, all right, let's, you take the blue lenses and you put them on and you look at that drawing in this book and it just, it didn't make any sense at all. But then you took that off and you put the other ones on and it's like, whoa, all right, I'm looking through the right lenses and now I could see the picture. And what all the scribble really was, everything became clear. And it's like that when you read the Gospels within their proper genre. Sometimes you just don't see things, and all of a sudden, you read them through the lens of first century biography, and things jump out at you that you never saw before. So keep in mind the, what ancient biography was. It was to illuminate who the main character is, okay? To tell you about that person. Who is this person we're talking about and studying in this biography? So it start off, as I mentioned a moment ago, and in chapter one, John the Baptist is the prophet who prepares the way for God in fulfillment of prophecy, and he's preparing the way for Jesus. So right away in Mark chapter one, it's almost as though Mark is saying, I'm gonna give you a biography of God. <laughs> and then you come to Mark chapter two. Jesus uh, is talking to some people and they take a paralytic and they lower this paralytic through the ceiling. And he sees the guy's faith and he says, child, your sins are forgiven you. 
And the Jewish leaders there say, well, that's blasphemy because only God for can forgive sins. Yep. So Mark is here, he's illustrating who Jesus is through his deeds. Mark chapter 3, Jesus says that his exorcisms demonstrate that he has bound Satan and now is plundering his kingdom. Because they come and they say, well, he's casting out Satan because he's Satan. And Jesus talks about, no, no, look, if you want to go in and you want to plunder the house that belongs, if you're a thief and you want to go in and rob a house and it belongs to a strong man, you just can't go in. You've got to bind the strong man and once you've done that, the house owner, you can go in and take whatever you want. And he is relating this to his own uh, exorcisms of demons. He's basically saying he has bound the strong man or Satan and now is plundering his kingdom. Well, what human can bind Satan? And then you come to chapter 4. Um, Jesus is out there talking, or he's actually he's asleep, uh, and this big storm comes out. He's in this boat, he's asleep, and it's getting real dangerous, and the boat is filling with water, uh, waves crashing over it, and his disciples get him and wake him up, and they say, you know, save us, we're, we're dying here. Don't just sleep. Come on, we need you. And uh, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and they settle down. Well, according to the Old Testament, Psalms 89 and 107, and Ecclesiastes chapter 8, this is something that God does. And then you look at Mark chapter 5. Jesus raises someone from the dead, which, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 8, is something only God can do. Say, well, wait a minute, even the New Testament has others, raise, like Paul and Peter, raising people from the dead. The Old Testament has some prophets that's reported that they raised people from the dead. Um, what about that? They're not God. That's correct. But they did it in the name of God. They always would invoke the name of God and do it in the power of God, whereas Jesus just by his own word spoke it and raised the dead. Mark chapter 6. Jesus walks on water, something according to Job chapter 9, verse 8, is something only God can do. Mark chapter 9, Jesus casts out a demon. He, he just comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down and he hears this commotion going on uh, with his disciples and people all around. And he says, what's up, guys? And this guy, dad, comes up and he says, well, hey, I brought my son to your disciples, he's got a demon, they, they're trying to cast it out, they can't do it, can you help me? And Jesus ends up casting out the demon. Later on, his disciples come to him and they say, well, why couldn't we do it? And he says, well, guys, this kind only comes out by prayer. Now, I can just see at that point, Peter pulls Thomas aside and says, he didn't pray, he just spoke the word, the demon came out. And then you come to Mark chapter 12, where Jesus says he's not only David's son, but also his Lord. So he pre-existed David, and he's David's superior. Mark chapters 12 and 13 uh, talks about how Jesus stands in a special relationship with God as a son. And in that relationship, what does it mean that he's a son? Well, uh, in a sense that he's above all prophets, priests, and kings. He stands as God's uniquely divine son. And then in chapters 12, 13, and 14, Jesus is the apocalyptic son of man, uh, spoken about in Daniel chapter 7, and first Enoch, and the similitudes of Enoch, and then fourth Ezra, and this, this son of man, this apocalyptic son of man, is worshipped and served in a manner that only God is. So you can see all throughout the Gospel of Mark, Mark is painting a literary portrait of Jesus through what Jesus teaches and through his acts. That Jesus is God, no less than God in some sense. That's pretty cool stuff. And you may not necessarily see that unless you look at it and you realize, hey, the Gospels are ancient biographies, and this is what biography was about. And when you read it within its proper genre, all of a sudden, all the lines stick out, and you see the picture there. Pretty cool stuff. So we start off and we say, okay, the Gospels are ancient biographies. Now, that gives us some insight into some of the things they're teaching. But it also tells us something else. Because scholars have long reckon, recognized 
that ancient biographies aren't necessarily written like modern biographies. They don't have the same rules. And see, unless we know this, uh, and the average Christian or person doesn't understand or know this because they haven't studied the Gospels within their cultural contexts, um, and they read them. I, I mean, I'm, I was guilty of this too uh, in the past, and you read them as though they're biographies with 20th and 21st century literary conventions. Well, modern bio biography, as we know it, is only about 200 years old. So before then, they operated by some different rules, and they offered, they, they allowed some flexibility in the way one could report things. So this is what I'd heard, this is what I read about. Uh, Richard Burge's book, What Are the Gospels? Um, he was a classicist, trained in the classics, and at that point, there were a couple of people like uh, Charles Talbert and David Awney, um, who were uh, Talbert at Baylor, Awney at Notre Dame, and they were saying the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies. And, and Burge was saying, no, they're not. I mean, I've, I'm trained in the classics. They're obviously not biographies. And so he did this, his, his doctoral research on it to try to disprove that they were biographies and he ended up concluding that they are most certainly Greco-Roman biographies or share much in common with them. And his book, What Are the Gospels, became just a watershed book. I mean, it was a game changer in the world of New Testament studies. And now the majority of New Testament scholars, regardless of one's theological background, accept that the Gospels come from a Greco-Roman biographical tradition. Um, and if they're not pure as Greco-Roman biography, they sure share a lot in common with them. So if they are, uh, allow flexibility in the way that stories about their main subject, in the case of the Gospels, Jesus, if they allow flexibility in the way they report it, what does that actually look like? What kind of flexibility? What are we actually talking about here? So I thought, well, this would be an interesting study. And so I made a list of all the biographies written about anybody and that they were written within 150 years on each side of Jesus, and there are about 90 of them. And of those 90, 50 of them are written by Plutarch. And so I figured, well, I'm going to start, and I'm going to read Plutarch, I'm going to read all these biographies, and I'm going to try to get a really good idea of what ancient biographical writing was like, and I'm going to read books also on this, see what I can learn. Well, I got through uh, Plutarch's biographies, the 50 of them, the first time, and, and as I got through them, I thought, whoa, this is pretty interesting. Because of those 50, nine of those were written by the same person, but they have over, and they're using the same sources, but many of the stories overlap. So for example, the uh, assassination of Julius Caesar is discussed in Plutarch's Life of Caesar, Life of Cicero, Life of Brutus, Life of Antony. Um, and so you hear the same story, I think like six different times he tells it. So by comparing how the same author using the same sources tells the same story, let's see if there's differences in these. So it's not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different authors telling the same story and having differences. We're talking about the same author telling the same story six different times using the same sources, and let's see if there are differences. Are they, is he copying and pasting? What is he doing? And I found that there are 36 stories between these nine biographies that appear in two or more of them. And of those, there are differences in 30 of them. So, that makes some really interesting things. By studying those, I found a number of things about these flex the flexibilities in the way of reporting. Compositional devices. And most of these are compositional devices that classical scholars have acknowledged for a long time. That this is how the classical authors and the post-classical authors would write. So what I want to present to you over the next few minutes is I want to say that you can read <laughs> back to my adolescence, you can read the Gospels more accurately by understanding three key elements in biographical writing. So I want to spend time and look at those three key elements. Number one, adapting. One of the key elements in biographical writing was adapting. And here I want to show you a difference between 
photograph and portrait. Now, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Alaska. I've been there three or four times now. And um, so you look at this photograph and you, you can know a couple things. Uh, because what you see in this photograph is entirely accurate. And just from what you see, you can infer a few things. Like number one, it was cold. And it was, it was 13 below that day. I had just spoken at a church that morning. I came out and my friend uh, up there, his name is Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy, if you're watching this, love you, man. Um, and uh, so he took me out to this lake afterward and he says, I, I wanna show you this lake. And we go out to this lake, and it was so cold. Like I said, 13 below. And I, I was uh, wearing a commando wool sweater that day, and then I had a wool coat and a scarf and a wool a beanie on. And I figured, well, I'd be fine, but no, 13 below. <laughs> it's, it's nasty. I mean, I, before that I was thinking, well, anything below 20, degrees, you know, it's, it's all going to be cold, but it isn't going to make that much difference. No, it makes a huge difference. It's like if it were 80 degrees out and someone says, hey, you got to go and it's 120 degrees, well, anything over 80, it doesn't really matter, right? No, it makes a big difference. So why I thought it'd be different when it was, we're talking about cold, I was just stupid. It was cold and I'm shivering on this lake, just shivering uncontrollably. And so my friend Jimmy said, Mike, I got something for you. Just hang on. So we went to his car, and he got this fur hat out of his truck, and he says, put this on. It would make a huge difference. And I put that on, and no kidding, within three minutes, I was sweating on the back of my head. And I was just comfortable. I could not believe. People say that you have a lot of heat come out of your head. You do. You do. I mean, I was totally warm once I put that on, and that's why I'm smiling. <laughs> so... Um, it was very cold that day. So you can know some things about this with real accuracy about that particular situation, but you don't know anything about it outside that photograph, what's going on. You don't know anything about me, period, right? Just by looking at that photograph, except at that point, you just know that I'm comfortable because I'm smiling. Now what about this one? This is more of a portrait. This isn't necessarily what this guy looks like in real life. This is the kind of guy that you don't want your daughter to be around. This guy, the way the artist has, or the photographer and the artist has taken this and cast the shadows, tells us something about this person. This is not a good guy. You want to stay away from this guy. He's, he's not a good character. Now, this is not a photograph this is a portrait. It's telling us more than if they just took a, a purely precise, accurate photograph of this guy. The artistic changes in this tell us something much, much more than what a photograph could capture. Truth in an accurate sense, but not necessarily a precise sense, as one of my friends, Daryl Bach, would say. So biographies, they have elements of photograph, and they have elements of portrait in them. That was the purpose of an ancient biography. Elements of photograph, elements of portrait. They're kind of hybrids. Now, that's adapting. I'll give you an example of modern. If we saw this kind of meadow, and let's say there was a couple holding hands walking through this meadow on this beautiful day, we'd have something very accurate there. We'd know that this couple are just walking through a meadow on a, on a beautiful day. But if the photographer cast a little haze over that meadow, that adds something. It tells us something more about that situation. It adds this romantic element to it. And if you saw that couple, you could, you could actually, by seeing this photograph with the haze over it, Maybe you didn't feel some butterflies in your stomach that just catches that romantic element of that moment and captures what they are feeling. That's something the actually untouched up photograph would not capture. So this little bit of flexibility to make it a portrait captures truth 
It's not trying to deceive, it's capturing truth. It is accurate, but not in a precise sense. Something similar goes on in ancient biography. Let me give you one example here. Many, 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 but let me give you one. Matthew's genealogy. Now, there's been a lot of discussion. It's like, whoa, if I compare Matthew's genealogy with Luke's genealogy, they just don't match up. And how does this work? Oh, well, Matthew's genealogy is through Joseph, and uh, Luke's genealogy is through Mary. That doesn't work. <laughs> nice try, but it doesn't work. And you start to notice something as you go through Matthew's genealogy. And by the, it's chapter 1, and by the time you get to verse 17, Matthew says, so these are all the generations of Jesus. You have 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon, and 14 generations from the deportation to Jesus. So in all, you've got 42 generations. He says, these are all the generations. But then you go to Luke, and there are more. And then you go to the Old Testament, and there's some generations that Luke neglected to mention. So you say, well, did, is Matthew just wrong in his math here? But then you see these three sets of 14 generations that Matthew is trying to lay out things in three sets of 14. And you say, there's something special about that number 14. And usually, if it's said three times, it's done for emphasis. And then you notice one more thing about Matthew's genealogy, that the 14th generation in the second set is Jeconiah. And he was the uh, Israelite king that went off, was taken, over, uh, taken off to Babylon with the rest of the Israelites. But then the first generation in the third set is Jeconiah. Matthew kind of cheats and reuses that name Jeconiah. He said, well, why is he doing this? Well, because it's those three sets of 14 that he's really interested in. Well, what's so special about the number 14? Well, back then, you had a rhetorical device called gematria. And gematria, oh, okay, so I, there's the text. So gematria is where you would have uh, letters are signed a numerical value. Now, in ancient Hebrew, there are no vowels. So everything was a consonant. And the word David, Dawid, has three consonants. D is the fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and the W would be a six. So you add that up, that's 14. And what Matthew is saying here, for emphasis three times, he has artistically arranged his genealogy of Jesus in a manner to communicate Jesus is the son of David. He's the Messiah. So, it's not like he's doing sloppy history here. He is more interested, instead of listing all the different, he's not making up these generations. He's putting down actual generations that were involved, but he's not interested in being exhaustive. He's more interested in painting this literary portrait of who Jesus is, the character. He's the Messiah, the son of David. So this is a little bit of the flexibility, the portrait aspect of, of ancient biography. So to say that Matthew and Luke's genealogies contradict one another is to miss what Matthew is going on, what, what he's doing. He's painting this portrait of Jesus as the son of David, the Messiah. It's not a contradiction as long as you recognize that ancient authors could do this because their primary objective is to paint that portrait of who that person is. They're not so interested in having everything with the precision of a court transcript. The second key issue in reading the, uh, the Gospels more accurately is to understand that they're paraphrasing. They're paraphrasing. Now, today when we say paraphrasing, we think about uh, it's just rewording things in, in a way. Uh, we might think of, you know, there's different translations of the Bible, and then you have a paraphrase. It's not word for word, it's just communicating the thoughts in a simpler, uh, lower level English language. So, but that's not necessarily how they would paraphrase in antiquity. You had what were called compositional textbooks. And when youth, children of the elite, um, 
were in the second, their secondary and tertiary education. They would use these compositional textbooks and it would be teaching them how to write, uh, uh, write things like eulogies and speeches and histories and all this kind of stuff. And so you would have to learn, you'd give, be given these exercises in what were called progymnosmata or preliminary exercises. And you had several of these, but in the first century you had a guy named Theon who wrote these compositional textbook, uh, compositional textbook in Greek, and then you had Quintilian who wrote one in, in Latin. Now the, these, they didn't invent these things. We know that they were in play before then, but these guys are our first extant, they have the first extant compositional textbooks. Let me give you some examples of how they would uh, give these exercises for paraphrasing. So what they would do is they'd say, all right, I'm gonna give you a paragraph from Thucydides's, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, and I want you to paraphrase it using these, this technique, and then I want you to paraphrase it using this technique, and then paraphrase it again using this technique. Well, instead of giving you that paragraph, let's just make this real simple. So one thing you could do is syntax. Change the syntax or the grammatical structure. So instead of saying, let's say the original is, we're gonna have an original sentence here, okay? The original sentence is, today I heard my lecture. Now, in order to change the syntax, it's really easy. You just change the grammatical structure of the words. I heard Mike lecture today. Just change some word order. Now, Greek is quite a bit different than English. And there are many different ways to say things in Greek. So, um, in English, you're always going to put the, the, the subject first. And then you're going to have the, word, the verb, and then that's going to be followed by a direct object, indirect object, something like that. But the subject comes first, then the verb. In Greek, you could have the direct object first, and then the subject, and then the verb. Or you could have the verb first, and then the direct object, and then the subject. It didn't matter what order you put it in, because the endings were different. So if any of you know German or Latin, you guys are studying Latin, so you know that the endings change according to whether it's the nominative, or the genitive, the dative, or the accusative case, right? Uh, the same thing like French and, uh, and uh, many other languages, okay? So you would know the, what it's, the part it's playing in the sentence by the ending of each word. In fact, my friend Dan Wallace says, just the sentence, I love you, you can say that about 200 different ways in Greek. So it was easy to change the syntax. All right, you could paraphrase through addition. So instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, if you were going to paraphrase that, and you want to still communicate the thought, but you're going to paraphrase it by adding, it would be, today I heard Mike lecture on gospel differences. Now maybe that original sentence, this isn't a word for word reproduction of that original <laughs> sentence, but you still communicated the thought by expanding that actual sentence. Or you could paraphrase through subtraction. So instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, you could just say, I heard Mike lecture. You're not communicating everything the same, but it's still the general thought. You could paraphrase through substitution. So you'd use a synonym. Instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, you could say, today I listened to Mike lecture. These are simple things, but then they get a little more complex. You could change a statement to a question. So instead of saying, today I heard Mike lecture, you could say, did you know that I heard Mike lecture today? Or it could go a little further and um, take a change of statement to an exclamation. Today I heard Mike lecture. Oh, I'm so glad I heard Mike lecture today. That's what you guys are going to say when you go home, right? Or how about this one, create a dialogue. Today I heard Mike lecture, that's the original. But in order to make it a little more interesting and communicate some more thoughts behind it, you create a dialogue out of that. Whoop. What did you do today? I heard Mike lecture. How was it? Great, I learned some of the reasons why the Gospels often differ from one another. Now that, that dialogue may never have taken place. But you create that dialogue as a means of paraphrasing in order to communicate the thoughts. 
You could alter order. Let me give you an example of that. Like Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. It's found in Matthew and Luke. The first one where Satan says, you know, you're hungry, you can turn command and these stones, they'll turn into bread. And then you have the second one in Matthew, hey, I'll take you up to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem, just throw yourself off and uh, God will give his charge to his angels to rescue you. And the third one, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll just bow down and worship me. Well, when you read the same thing in Luke, the second and third temptations are inverted. So you could change order in order to paraphrase. Uh, the parable of the sower, Jesus says, um, okay, let's talk about the seed, and the seed is the gospel. So you could take the gospel and you sow it, and some, it, it, it just falls on the ground and it doesn't get buried, and the birds come along and they take it, they snatch the seed up. And the second kind of seeds, they fall into shallow, shallow or rocky ground, and because it's shallow, they uh, sprout up real quickly, but then the sun comes and burns them and kills them. And then the third kind of seed falls on really good ground, and it, it um, yields fruit. And Matthew says that fruit, or Mark says that fruit will multiply 30, 60, and 100 fold. But when you read Jesus given the same parable in Matthew, he inverts the order and he says that fruit bears fruit 100, 60, and 30 fold. And then when you read it in Luke, he just says, it bears fruit a hundredfold. What is Luke doing? Substitution. Or, I mean, subtraction. You're right. Subtraction. He's doing subtraction. You could alter the person speaking. Plutarch does this. The ancient, other ancient authors do it. I'm just giving you an example from the Gospels so far. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. So we read this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the story in all three Gospels comes in the same order uh, just after Jesus has picked, uh, his disciples have picked grain on a Sabbath. And then you have this story uh, come immediately afterward, which tells us you can't just say that this is any differences are because it was a different event. No, it's the same event. So let's look at the differences. Here's what Luke says, and what Mark, and I'm quoting from Luke, but Mark says the same thing. He says, on another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And then Jesus said to them, that is the Jewish leaders present, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at them all, he said to, they, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. So this is what Luke and Mark say, okay? He stands there. And Jesus sees that they want to accuse him, and he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, to do good? Now, let's read the same story in Matthew. Remember, this is the same event. Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they, the Jewish leaders, asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you is a sheep if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath? will not take hold of it and lift it out. So the difference here is in Mark and Luke, Jesus is the one to ask them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Whereas in Matthew, Matthew transfers that to the lips of the Jewish leaders in the synagogue and they ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The story is the same. In Mark and Luke, Jesus asks them, and they never say anything. There's no dialogue. But here we've got a little, just a, a brief dialogue going on where they ask him, and he answers. So we can see this happening. And there are other parts where this happens as well. Uh, the parable of the vineyard and the wicked tenants, uh, you know, where they, they, they send the, the guy who owns the vineyard, builds it up, he leases it out, 
and then he sends servants once the crops, uh, the, everything's ready, to get his, the first fruits of that. And they beat the servants up, and then he sends some more, and they beat and kill some of them. And then he sends, finally, his son, you know, and they kill him. And Jesus in uh, Mark and Luke says, so what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will destroy the tenants and hand over the vineyard to someone else. That's what Jesus says. But in Matthew, Jesus says, so what will the owner do? And the Pharisees answer back, well, he will come and he will put all those wicked tenants to a miserable death. And then he will hand the vineyard over to others who will give him the due pay. So you can see Matthew again changes something into a dialogue that Mark and Luke present merely as a statement of Jesus talking to them. Paraphrasing. You could alter the person being addressed. The baptism, when you read Mark and Luke on this, the baptism says you, uh, the voice from heaven says to Jesus, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. When you read the same story in Matthew, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The difference, of course, is in Mark and Luke, God's voice is addressing Jesus directly. Whereas in Matthew, Matthew alters things here and he recasts uh, God's voice so that it's speaking to the crowd. Why does he do this? Well, we can only guess, but it seems like it would make sense that Matthew does this because remember, he's writing for his readers and he wants it as though God is speaking to the readers about who Jesus is. God is verifying that Jesus is his son. Literary devices. It doesn't change anything about the truth of the text of, of what is being taught. You have some differences where the, the peripheral details are allowed to be altered. This is something that's common amongst ancient authors, okay? This was allowed in ancient history and biographical writing. And we see the gospel authors doing it as well. And you think about it, if the gospel authors, if they're writing within that culture, we should be surprised that they're not doing these kind of things. And the third key element of understanding the gospels within their setting is the process of simplifying. Authors would simplify their accounts, and there were different ways of doing this. Let me give you some. How many of you are married in here? Okay, quite a few of you. Well, then, you, those of you who are married know exactly what I'm talking about when I say there's the guy version of the story and there's the girl version of the story. Girls like details. Now, I'm generalizing here, but girls like details. Lots of details. They want to know, and I see the females smile in here, they want to know what happened, where it happened, why it happened, how it happened, who was there, what they were doing at the time, what they were saying, what they were thinking, and how they were feeling. And then they want to know how you feel about it. Now guys are different. We like bullet points. Get to the bottom line, please. The game is coming on in five minutes. Um, we don't care about a lot of the peripheral details that we might regard as insignificant. Um, we judge according to our audience who we're speaking to. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the phone talking to someone, and as I'm telling a story, my wife is there in the background saying, you know it didn't happen that way. And it's just this little detail that I alter a little bit so that I don't have to give a five minutes of background information um, which my, the person on the other end does, could, doesn't care at all about that background information, and I'm communicating the point clearly and succinctly to them. So it might not be precisely, uh, precise in a 100% sense, but I'm still communicating the essence, the gist of what happened. All right, well, some versions in antiquity uh, their stories would be more like the girl version and some more like the guy version. In our Gospels, Mark gives us the girl version a lot of times, whereas Matthew and Luke will give us the guy version. 
Now, let me just give a couple of examples of how this works. Literary spotlighting. This is when an author directs focus on the subject to the point that he neglects to mention others who were likewise involved. Now, I use he because they were all guys who wrote these things in antiquity. Um, so I'm not trying to be male bias here or something, okay? So, author directs focus on a subject to the point he neglects to mention others who were likewise involved. Let me give an example. Um, in 63 BC, in November, there was a Roman senator named Lucius Sergius Catalina. Uh, we'll just call him Catiline is what they say in English. And he was uh, trying to rebel against Rome, and he had lost his bid to become consul, which was the top, it would be like our president. And he had lost the bid two years in a row, and... Um, and so now he wanted to get some thugs together, some other co-conspirators, kill all the senators, burn, torch the city, and then start all over. Well, some people found out about this. They wrote some letters, and they informed Crassus, who was one of the leading Romans at that point. And he was the famous Roman general, Crassus was, who uh, defeated Spartacus. You've heard of Spartacus. Um, and so what ends up happening Crassus gets all these letters, and he and two other guys, Metellus and Marcullus, go to Cicero's house at night, because Cicero is the consul that year. You did, you've heard of Cicero, but probably many of you didn't know he was the most powerful person in Rome at times. And this particular year, he's the most powerful person in Rome. So they go to his house at night, and they wake Cicero up. And, and they come, Cicero comes out and says, what's up? And they said, hey, we got these letters and these are to be delivered to all the senators, but the bottom line is Catiline has amassed some forces and he's planning on torturing the city and killing us all. Now that's how we read it in Plutarch's biography of Cicero. But in his biography of Crassus, he shines a, a spotlight on Crassus and it's Crassus who comes at night and wakes up Cicero and tells him. Now, he doesn't say only Crassus, but he only mentions Crassus. Why doesn't he mention the others? Because he's shining that spotlight on Crassus because he's the main character. The others are insignificant. For Plutarch there, there is no need to mention. He's simplifying by using literary spotlighting. Now, the next day, Cicero gets up and he calls the Senate together and he says, here's Here's, look, here's the situation, guys. Hands out the letters. We got a problem here. Um, and at that point, Julius Caesar, who is just up and coming, he's not the real powerful Caesar at that point, um, he's a senator and he gets up and he says, well, here's what I think we should do. I think we should arrest these conspirators and put them in prison, confiscate all their, their possessions, and let's just wait until we destroy Catiline and then we'll put these guys on trial. And then you got two guys that stand up, uh, Catulus, who's going to be the consul next year, and a guy named Cato. He's my favorite Roman. And Cato gets up, Catulus and Cato, and they both object and they say, no, these guys need to be put to death immediately because if they're not, the Romans will look at us as being soft and it will encourage more uh, rebellion. And so they decide, Cicero makes the uh, decision to put the uh, conspirators to death. Now this is how we read it in, in Plutarch's biographies of Cicero and Cato. Uh, I'm sorry, Caesar and Cicero. But when we read Plutarch's biography of Cato, he shines his literary spotlight on Cato. So when Caesar says, let's just arrest these guys, Cato gets up and he says, no, they need to be put to death. Same reasons, but Catulus isn't mentioned there. Why? Because this is a biography of Cato, and Catulus isn't important here. So Plutarch's not trying to deceive, he's just simplified. Spotlighting in the Gospels, yes, it goes on. And it, it goes on, it's pretty clear in, in one of the texts, the passages, that is most frequently cited as one of the contradictions in the Gospels. It's the empty tomb narrative. And here, how many angels are at the empty tomb? Well, Matthew and Mark say there's one. Luke and John mention two. Well, which is it? One or two? Or if you go with Bart Ehrman, it depends which gospel you read, right? 
So what's going on here? I think literary spotlight's going on. Why? Because I think that Mark, followed by Matthew, are just mentioning the angel who is doing the announcing that Jesus has been raised, and that's why the tomb is empty. Well, Mike, how do you know that? Well, I don't know it for certain. It's certainly a plausible explanation. It's every bit as plausible as a contradiction for certain. But I think we got even more reason to think that spotlighting is going on here. Because I can give you another instance where it's going on in the resurrection narratives. What happens at this point when you have these angels? Well, how many women went to the tomb? According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there were multiple women. John only mentions Mary Magdalene. Well, what's really interesting is when you read about this in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, early in the morning while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene got up and went to the tomb and saw that it was empty. And so she ran back to, to Peter and the beloved disciple, and she said, they have taken the Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. Who's we? That's the second instant, but we've got one more. And that is, as soon as they tell the disciples, according to Luke, Peter gets up and runs to the tomb and found it as the women had said. In John, it says Peter and the beloved disciple got up and ran to the tomb and found it as Mary had said. I said, well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? Was it just uh, Peter or is it Peter and the beloved disciple? Well, number one, Luke doesn't say it was just Peter. He only mentions Peter. So that could certainly be literary spotlighting. You say, well, yeah, but it could be a contradiction as well. Let me give you a reason, another reason why it's probably spotlighting. Because just 12 verses later, Luke says, he's got Jesus talking to these Emmaus disciples. And it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And so Jesus is going to play with these guys a little bit. He says, guys, why the long faces? And they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on? And Jesus says, no, tell me. What's happening here? Playing with them. And he says, well, we had this guy, Jesus. We thought he was the prophet, a Messiah. But they, they crucified him this past Friday. But our women folk went to the tomb this morning, and they saw angels who said he'd been raised from the dead. And then some of our own, some of our own, went to the tomb and found it as the women had said. Well, wait a minute, Luke. Just 12 verses earlier, you said just Peter. No, he didn't say just Peter. He only mentions Peter, the lead disciple. But he obviously knows that there were more because he says some of our own just 12 verses later. Luke is obviously using spotlighting here. John is pretty sure to be using spotlighting when he only mentions Mary Magdalene and says, we don't know where they laid him, she says. And so what about the angels? He's probably using that spotlighting when Mark, followed by Matthew, mentions the angel who's doing the announcing, but Luke and John mention both angels being there. That's not a contradiction. It's a, it's a compositional device, a literary device that would result in the difference. Transferal. This is when an author knowingly attributes words or actions to a different person. It's usually done to simplify. Let me give you an example. Now the year is 52 BC, and it's in a period, Rome is in a period of serious crisis. There's a lot of riots, there's a lot of corruption going on, and Rome is ready to collapse. So the Senate makes an, um, a decision that what they, the only, only thing they have left to do is to put um, Rome in the hands of a single person who will get them out of it. And they say the only person who could even possibly help us here is Pompey. Now some would pronounce his name Pompey, but Pompey is the city where the volcano erupted. Um, uh, Pompey is the famous Roman general. Um, who was later defeated by Caesar. So Pompey, 52 BC, they say, we're going to put it Rome into your hands, and you will have virtually absolute power. You don't have to go through a Senate. Your word is law, and you can do this for one year. You've got one year to get us out of this mess. And so Pompey establishes a bunch of new laws, and one of those laws is 
If you have a friend who is on trial, you cannot come in and give a really positive speech about this guy because it has nothing to do with whether that person is guilty or innocent. And so this is a good law and it's established. But then Pompey proceeds to break his own law because that year there was a guy named Plancus. I didn't like that name, Plancus. Some of you are gonna have kids someday. You have a son, you're gonna be thinking about names. Plancus, just remember that. Plancus, his friend Plancus is on trial. And so Pompey is outside the city at that point. He's with his army. And the Romans had a rule that when you were outside the city with an army, you could not come in. Not until you left your army. Um, and so Pompey can't come in. His friend Plancus is on trial. So what Pompey does, he's breaking his own rule. He writes a speech, a lavish speech, to praise uh, Plancus. It's against the law, but he does anyway. He gives it to an emissary, and he sends that emissary in and that emissary delivers Pompey's speech. And this is what's told in the life of Cato, and it's told in the life of Cato because Cato was on the jury at that point, and he objected very strenu strenuously. Plutarch tells the same story in the life of Pompey, but in that, he doesn't mention the emissary. Instead, he has Pompey come in the city and deliver the speech himself. He simplifies, rather than saying, well, he sent an emissary, and he just says Pompey delivered the speech. Same kind of thing that's going on, but he alters the details to simplify it. And we actually find some, some things similar going on in the Gospels at times. When Jesus healed the centurion's servant, now here's what happens. The centurion has a servant who's sick. How do you like my stick figures? You don't like them? I worked hard on those things. So he's got this servant who's sick. And so what he does, according to Luke's Gospel, he sends some Jewish elders out to talk to Jesus. And they go to Jesus and they say, look, we have this centurion for him. He's got this sick servant who's really valuable to him. Please come and, and heal him. Because this centurion has been very good to us. He helped us build our synagogue. And he's very uh, positive toward our people. And so Jesus says, all right, let's go. So they start heading back in. Well, the centurion finds out about it, and so he sends some of his friends out to Jesus. And those friends say, well, the centurion learned you were coming, and he's saying, no, he says he's unworthy for you to come into the house, his house. So he says, look, he's a man of authority just like you, and he tells some soldiers go, and they go, or other soldiers come, and they come, and he tells some slaves, do this, and they do it. And the centurion says, look, you're, Jesus, you're a man of authority just like him, so just speak the word and a servant will be healed. And Jesus praises the centurion for his faith in front of the others, and he heals his servant from afar without ever seeing the centurion. But when you read the same story in Matthew, you have the centurion himself who goes out to meet Jesus. And so, Jesus, I got this servant. All right, let's go. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, I'm, I'm unworthy to have you come under my house. Same stuff, but it's the centurion who says these things. Here's another story, a request to Jesus. So you got James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and their mom come to Jesus, and the mom says, hey Jesus, I got a favor I wanna ask you, and he says, what can I do for you? He says, look, when you come into your kingdom, when you're glorified, I, I wanted, when you're on your throne, put one of my sons on your right and one on your left. And Jesus says to them, well, okay, James and John, can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? Yep. Can you be baptized with the baptism which I'm about to be baptist, ba baptized? Yeah, we can do that. Well, you will drink that cup of suffering. You will be baptized with the kind of death I'm going to be. But to sit on my right and left is, uh, it's not up to me. It's up to my father. And they walk away, and it's like, that didn't go well. That's when you read it in Matthew. Now, when you read it in Mark, Mark brushes old mom out of the text. And it's just James and John who come up to Jesus and say, we'd like to ask a favor of you. When you come into your kingdom, can we sit on your right and left? Same stuff going on, but old mom's not mentioned. Why? Because she's not really substantive in the story here. It's really James and John that are behind this. And so he only has them. He has them asking the question instead. Transferal. Compression. 
This is when an author knowingly portrays uh, events to have occurred over a shorter period of time than they had actually occurred. Cursing of the fig tree by Jesus. Now, this is told in a couple different, uh, Mark, and it's told in Matthew. Now, the way it goes in Mark, Mark gives us the girl version of the story. And it starts off, well, they, early in the morning, they got up, they were in Bethany. And they started to head into Jerusalem. And as they got close to Jerusalem, they saw a fig tree. And Jesus was hungry and he wanted to eat. And there were no figs on it, so he cursed it. Well, then they went inside the city and they spent some time in the temple. At the end of the day, they left the temple and they went back to Bethany and they spent the night in Bethany. And the next morning they got up and they had breakfast. And Peter, he wanted everything. He wanted eggs and he wanted bacon. Well, no, he's Jewish, so he had no bacon. And he wanted coffee. Give me the sugar. I want cream. Things. And Jesus, he had pancakes. He had uh, Mrs. Butterworth's light syrup, decaf coffee, and all that. So he, was, he was watching his way. And then they go into the city, and as they arrive at that tree, the fig tree, Peter sees that it's withered and died. He says, look, the tree that you cursed yesterday is dead. That's Mark. That's the girl version of the story. He gives us all these details. Now, Matthew's different. He gives us the guy version. They got up, went to Jerusalem, cursed tree, it died. <laughs> That's it. They'll go on in the city. Next day, they go home, come back, see us. Nope, he curses it, boom. <laughs> Withers dies on the spot. He's compressing the story. By the way, notice that it's Matthew that does a whole lot of these things more than the others. We see the stuff that's going on. And you say, yeah, but Matthew, why is he doing this? I like Mark's version. I like the girl version because it tells it more like I would have seen had I actually been there. But you know what? I'm kind of glad Matthew did that because he tells more stories. He's got more space to tell more stories about Jesus. He could have told the girl version of those stories, taken up all, you only got so much room on that scroll. But he gets more stories out because he, he uses economy in the way he tells those stories. I'm glad we've got both versions. But what I wanted you to see is these aren't errors. These aren't like contradictions or errors. These are compositional devices, the way they wrote in antiquity that resulted in many of these differences. So in summarizing, you can read the Gospels more accurately by understanding three key elements in biographical writing, adapting, paraphrasing, and simplifying. If you want more information on this, um, I've written a book on it, uh, published by Oxford University Press, just came out this year. Why are there differences in the Gospels? What, what, you, what we can learn from ancient biography? And I go through just tons of examples in Plutarch Tons of examples from the Gospels where you can see this. They have some outside. I don't make any money off these books. Um, I think the school does or some, whoever does. And, um, and I'll sign them if you get one of those. Um, so that's, that's something. I've got some lectures on my website. Got some lectures, debates that you can watch, and go there, and we've got some articles as well.